Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Our interview last week was so good that we decided to turn it into a two-part series. If you missed last week, you'll find the link in the show notes. It's not mandatory that you listen, but we want to make sure that you don't miss out on this amazing conversation. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Roxanne Durhach. Thanks for coming in again this week for Authentic Living with Roxanne. Uh, today, I have a special young man um, that... Uh, we are privileged to spend um, some time in a speaker's bureau based out in New York City where he lives. Um, so Ezra, uh, thanks for coming in today to kind of chat with us about um, your, your subject expertise, which is rituals. Thanks so much for having me. It's, it's an honor to be here and it's an honor to still be considered a young man. <laughs> well, you look very young. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see you know, the leaders and, or maybe the CEOs that are listening to it. And they're thinking, hmm, this sounds interesting. Ezra, why might I consider rituals? Like I'm having some difficult, well, no different than anybody else. And we got the quiet quitting and, you know, I've got all that other stuff going on and there's massive change, you know, post pandemic, all that kind of stuff. There's some morale issues. Why might I consider a concept of what you're suggesting? What would be the benefits? Yeah, uh, great question. Thanks for asking it. Come to my website, email me. I'd love to talk to you more about it. If you're thinking that, I'd love to talk to you more about it. Uh, Ezra at ritualist.life. I'll make the plug right now. Um, you know, I think Reed, Reed Hoffman says it, says it best. Um, he says, you know, the right rituals in the right place will help you build your culture, cohere your team and achieve your goals. Mm -hmm. But if you aren't intentional about the rituals you create, you may find that rituals spring up on their own that hold you back. So, you know, what I would say to that person, um, you know, CEO, I would say, look, um, you already have rituals at your company because you have a culture. It might not be very well defined, um, but you do have a culture and you already have rituals that embody the values of that culture. They just might not be very good rituals. Um, and that might look like they're not effective at embodying the values that you sincerely hold and that you want. You know, you, you're such a human centered leader and you really want them to know that you care, but like your rituals aren't actually communicating that. Or even worse, right, is that your rituals are actually uh, working against your values. They're communicating something totally different. And so uh, if you're wondering that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the question that you just have to ask yourself is, is not do I need or do I want rituals at my workplace? It's do I want good, effective rituals that work for me and my, and my vision? Um, because... You know, what I, would what I would lovingly and, and with a smile remind people is that rituals have been uh, used in every single culture in the world, in every place throughout human history from the beginning of time. Right? We have evidence of rituals from our earliest ancestors um, at, the, at the beginning of the hunt, right? Um, and so for something that powerful and that core to human consciousness, and behavior, how, how could you possibly leave it out of the conversation? It's like a, it's like a interconnectedness. I, I ran a team with a hospital, in a hospital mental health facility, and I was the new leader. I'll, I'll give you this example. And this is, this is, this is so basic Ezra, but it worked like clockwork. They had had, um, my predecessors, uh, you know, there was some issues with the man, with the leadership that they had had. And then I was the new kid on the block kind of thing. Um, young, right out of grad school, kind of, you know, going with just, I'm going to, you know, have them see that, you know, they're going to trust me. And you know how that goes when you're, you know, you're starting with a team that has been through a lot. And one other thing I did, and this is, you know, I, I, I think I talk about it in my second book, but um, 
for Christmas, right, um, what I did was, um, and it was an outpatient team, I had red, I bought everybody on my team red t-shirts, and I put outpatient clinic, and then I put their names under it. And then I took them all to lunch. And, you know, something that, it, you know, small, Ezra, you wouldn't think, right? Like, I mean, and the cost, you know, to the company overall was so minimal. But it, w- it was such a, um, an invisible, cohesive link that today, I, I mean, this is, I'm talking 25 years ago now, um, you know, when I connect or we get together, they'll still talk about the significance that, um, you know, something that, you know, it was to me, it, it was small and, you know, but it was really, really significant because what they meant to them is um, that they were valued and that they were a team. And a lot of the things that they've been holding out around getting over that small act actually helped them move. Like if they, they got to accelerate a little bit quicker than I thought possible with, you know, it, that was one thing, but one thing amongst it, everything else. So sometimes not understanding the impact of sometimes little things, we underestimate how uh, things like symbolism or rituals uh, to your point can really, really help people feel more connected or belonging. And you talked a little bit about belonging earlier. I, I love that example. It's a, it's a beautiful example. And there's so many, you know, the designer in me could really pick that apart and show you, okay, well, this is why clothing, right, is a is an incredible tool, you know, ritual tool. And this is why the lunch was important. And this is why um, communicating that gift um, as a communication of, I value you. I am grateful for you. Not just like, uh, you show up at, at work and there's some shirt on your desk. You know, there's all sorts of things that you did that clearly had an impact on people because they're still talking about it. And, and it meant something to them that was far bigger than a t-shirt. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I, 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 I love that example. And, and I, and I, I especially love, you know, I gave a talk, um, you know, the power of tiny rituals. You know, we often think about these big, massive, you know, the Olympic opening ceremonies and um, these massive things uh, that we do in our culture. Um, And that can make us feel afraid to approach this as a tool, um, especially in our teams. But, you know, there's, again, actually from, from the uh, medical field, this is just what's on my mind, but at, at Beth Israel Deaconess, they had this terrible occurrence of a wrong site surgery um, in the OR where they, they performed the, the surgery on the wrong part of the body. And so they had to do this soul sweeping changes um, ar- around their procedures. And one of the procedures that they did that they instituted was this ritual called the moment of reverence, which is right before the operation begins, after they've done the pre-surgery checklist and all those functional things, which by the way, are just as important, right? Ritual is not magic. It doesn't make everything happen. You still got to, you know, like I say, like if you're onboarding someone, you still got to tell them where the bathroom is and what their computer password is. You know, <laughs> you got to get the stuff too. Um, but right before that, uh, they, they make their first incision. They actually take a moment where one of the nurses reads about the name of the patient, talks a little bit about their family history. Uh, you know, are they a parent? Are they a sibling? Um, what do they do? And, um, and everyone in this, in the OR is silent, uh, for about a minute as they read about this person and they just look at that individual and they found, they studied, it had all this incredible effect on reducing um, all these different kinds of um, OR uh, mistakes and errors. And the people who are interviewed who talk about it say that, you know, it, it, it connects them to something bigger than just their job, just another sort of um, object on the table, but that this is a real human uh, in front of them. And that deserves, and the, the, the gravity of what it means to, to be trusted with their health and with their safety. So it can be as simple as just a minute of silence, right? Like, uh, and that too is available to us as a, as a ritual. And so I, 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 I like to give people a little freedom to, to think, you know, it can be as simple as lunch and a t-shirt. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, and obviously like, you know, I hadn't thought of it in the context of, you know, in, in the 
coaching or clinical realm at that point. I was just trying to have these 10 people who I think had poison darts in their basements that were, you know, going to take out the new leader. I just wanted them to come along because truly my heart was open with wanting to have them recognize that I'm there to see each and every one of their value. But unfortunately, the, you know, the shoes that I was stepping into, um, it had been a rough road for this team, right? So it made so much sense after the context, Ezra, because then I realized why should I be given trust um, after they've been through so many things, right? I had to really, really um, dig deep in order to demonstrate that really I'm, re you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm different. I really care about what we're doing, and we're, it's, we're they were all clinicians as well. Um, but then on until and it took I should. I, I should contextualize it took a couple of years um, before we can actually start to gel again, you know, really gel and really um, work on optimal functioning within the units. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because we, I think we probably do. And that's why I love this, this topic. We probably underestimate the value of some of the things, like you said, like if you leave it, leave it for it to go awry, there are rituals that get developed that are not so functional, which I'd like to talk a little bit more about too. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that I would, I would pick out from that as well, and this, this excellent example, you know, is that we often, we, we often, we often, um, are, we, we're often so involved in the work that we're doing, we're so heads down in the work that we're doing that we, we never really take the opportunity to slow down and lift it up as actually important. And so, you know, you could have spent that next three years doing exactly what you do, telling people you matter, I'm different, right? And, and doing all sorts of things functionally, like listening to them when they come to you with a problem, like all this stuff that, you know, because you're a good leader, you know how to do. But if you never take the opportunity to step back, and to, to, to name what it is that you're doing and to create a shared experience around it that lifts it up as important. Like, this is so important to me, communicating to you that I'm different and that I'm here for us to be and function as a team and to take those poison arrow darts and, you know, uh, uh, and, and throw, them, throw them away or like, I don't know, <laughs> transform them into, I don't know, I don't have a good example here, but, um, you know, if, if we don't take that opportunity, uh, we might not never, we, we might not ever realize that it is actually important and special to do so. And so what I really encourage leaders is, you know, whatever work that you're doing, like you're putting so much work into it already. So take the extra couple minutes, take the lunch break to slow down long enough to actually elevate it. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it doesn't always just magically do the work for you, but it's often an exponential factor that will increase the impact of what you're already doing to have a more significant impact on their lives. So really we go to the space, right? And, and with my new book, um, I talk a lot about the impact of awareness, right? Like, so, um, you know, ultimately businesses all have to make money. They have shareholders, all that kind of stuff, but, but, if a leader um, takes the time to really, really sit in awareness and, and stay or become connected or stay connected to who they are and what they value and how they want to express that, of which rituals would be a good way to do that, or to have a, that um, involved in kind of their space, people get an outward extension, um, implicit or explicit about what they value and how they want people to see them or experience them, right? Um, but again, if you're go, 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 and you're not stopping very often, um, you know, because you're concerned about the next quarter and those types of things, you're going to miss some valuable, valuable moments, uh, potentially for people to um, get connected based on something that you could develop um, that could be quite simple. Mm. Yeah, you know, rituals, I think the two of the most important elements to a ritual being successful are intention and attention. And, you know, and I, I hear in that awareness as well, bringing your, bringing your full attention to the moment 
and having a clear purpose of what you're, what you're bringing to the moment, your intention. And, um, and if we, we, we leave those out, um, we can find ourselves going through all kinds of motions that we're, that aren't actually what we want to be doing or who we really believe that we are, you know, and, and, and rituals, I sort of said earlier, they, they help us zoom in and really see and look at what we're doing and hold it with the most precious thing that we have to offer to the world, which is our time and attention. We can slow down long enough. It's the difference between just, you know, shoveling down your food and taking, if not a breath or three breaths to find a space of gratitude before eating. And we know from the studies how transformational that is, how transformational gratitude can be. And so, and it's just a thought in the mind. It's just a little awareness. It's just a little attention and it can truly transform us and transform the people around us. So let's say you're a new leader and you're not you know, what kind of things should I be thinking if I'm a new leader and I'm coming, you know, I'm, you know, I've learned everything in leadership school or MBA and things like that, but I'm wanting to kind of um, understand culture and create a culture of connection. Uh, what kind of things should this, these newer leaders consider um, in reference to um, some of the things that you talked about in reference to organizational kind of um, change or context? Oh gosh, that's such a big question. Uh, I feel like we need a whole other hour uh, just to really dig into all, all that. And, and it's so context specific, which is probably part of why that is a complex question because it really matters, you know, what kind of organization is, what are you doing? Uh, you know, how many employees, all that kind of stuff really matters. Uh, you know, the few things that I would really call people's attention to off the top of my head is one, the whole sort of bring your whole self to work thing is such a funny statement. Cause like, where are you, are you chopping off your arm and leaving it in the car? Like <laughs> your whole self is there, whether you like it or not. Right. And, and, you know, a workplace is a human place um, and a human place is an emotional space. So, you know, I love that, that Brene Brown quote, leaders must either invest a reasonable amount of time attending to fears and feelings or squander an unreasonable amount of time trying to manage ineffective and unproductive behavior. So <laughs> lean in to the vulnerability, to the courage, to the fear, to the feelings. Um, you know, don't try to create this myth of disembodied, you know, robotic automatons as your employees. They're human. Attend to that. Speak to it, especially if you're new. Um, recognize that if you're new, changes happen, there's loss in, in the room, there's anxiety in the room, speak directly to it. Don't be afraid of that. Have the, have the courage to address it head on. Um, I would encourage new leaders to really try to tap in and, and, and go through a process of, of visioning the most important, no more than three values of themselves personally and of the organization. Try to start to understand what the connection between those might be. And I would really encourage leaders to invest in a ground up approach. I, I often say, you know, rituals need to be invitations, not obligations. And so if you're sort of doing things to your employees or forcing them to like, here's this another meditation thing that you're required to go to on Mondays because it's good for your mental health, that's just going to become one more obligation that your boss is telling you to do. And you're going to resist it in your, even if you're there in your body, your mind, you're going to check out because you want to resist that. And so um, create a ground up approach that it enables the employees that you're working with to have um, agency in the process of determining uh, you know, the, the values that embody the culture and, and what it is those, what the values they want it to be. Um, and so that the eventual rituals that emerge from that will be, you know, they'll, they'll be stickier. They'll have uh, longer legs to walk, uh, in, in through the life of the organization, because it's not just going to be happening to them, but happening from them.
Well, I would think that when you're working with um, employees, there has to be a certain level of trust for them to be open for rituals as well. Like if there's absolutely a, because you know if you're going to create something together, then you're going to need everybody bringing what th- different ideas or perspectives of how wh- how the ritual would get developed, right? So, are there certain ingredients that's basically a part like a develop? Is there a recipe? And I know I'm being very basic here about how you formulate a ritual. Mm. Yeah, for what it's worth, trust so important and. Uh, you know, if there isn't trust in the organization, there's, there's nothing that you're going to build on that ground that will stand. It will all sink into the, into the, the hole that is a mistrust within an organization. And, and that's your first thing that you definitely need to address. Um, there's no recipe. Uh, and, I, and in fact, I, I really resist that kind of mentality when it comes to ritual, the what I call the do this, feel that kind of rituals where it's very transactional, you know, uh, you, you Google online and that's mostly what you find five rituals to go to bed earlier, like that kind of stuff. It's very transactional. It doesn't actually meet people where they are. Um, There is uh, my design process called the ritual lines, which are really eight lenses to look at any experience, eight questions um, to look at an experience uh, for creative inspiration. I would say though, you know, trying to start really at the top, top, top of the funnel for people as as wide as I can. um, The the first thing to really focus on is, you know, what's your goal? What's your purpose? What what are you, what are you trying to achieve um, with this ritual? Um, get clear on your intention. So um, I, I call it the three P's, uh, purposeful, particular, and personal. So why are you doing this? Which is your purpose? Why are you doing this? Your, your personal connection to this ritual? And why are you doing this? This particular thing of all the things, you know, to do a ritual, why are you lighting candles? So many things you could do, why candles? Um, so get clear on your intention. Uh, and then consider differentiation, the concept that rituals, like I said at the top uh, of our conversation, you know, rituals elevate something as in special or important or meaningful. And, and the way that they do that is they differentiate from the norm. So think about whatever it is, the normal thing that you're doing. What If the normal thing is we start meetings by five minutes of idle chit chat as we wait for people to get on and, uh, and then someone says, okay, we're ready. And they just dive in. If that's your norm, how do you differentiate from that? Uh, does, uh, does each employee, uh, you know, once a week, uh, get to choose the music that you listen to for those five minutes. Uh, is there a short uh, reading that gets done uh, that, you know, you're reading a book over the next you know year and five minutes a day, you know, you read at the top of the meeting. Is there, you know, what are the ways in which you can differentiate from the norm? And that's where I would start for anybody designing a new ritual. I like that. Just, so just being a bit different, not being over the top. If you've, you know, not been doing anything, but just to start with little incremental bits um, and getting people in, involved in it in, in kind of what, you know, what have they seen? What have they tried? You know, what has not worked maybe potentially too, as they, you know, like don't redo the things that, you know, kind of blew up, right? Don't try to iterate off it and, and try to, you know, resuscitate some of it just, you know, but to get people's feedback. But again, that's like, to your point, um, intention with attention. I love that because that that's what we're really saying is, okay, I'd like for us to be, let's say, uh, more productive because after the brutal quarter, after the third quarter, we kind of, um, uh, we need that downtime. So maybe, you know, designing something that allows people to, to honor that space, maybe before they go back to, you know, going back to optimal functioning again or whatever, like how do you maybe celebrate those types of things? So I, I think I, I hear what you're saying. That makes a lot of, a lot, a lot of sense. Now, Ezra, this has been amazing. I th- I've learned so much today. I, I love, uh, you know, I've, I love literature. I've got to tell you a story because I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. And um, so Carnival. I don't know if you've ever heard about Carnival, but in Trinidad and Tobago, it's it's Trinidad's known for as be, having one of the big biggest carnivals other than Rio and uh, Mardi Gras in in New Orleans. 
but you know, it's, it's funny, right? Because my culture, even though my background is Indian and Middle Eastern is, is very, very African because I grew up in the cultural context of what car- carnival was. So carnival got formulated um, in the, in, the Caribbean, because when slavery was abolished, what happened was that the slaves, when uh, um, they would see the regalian bulls and stuff with the French, the slaves would take dye, right, and paint their skins. And I don't know if you've ever seen any of the massive costumes that exist, but they're just phenomenal. Like, I mean, these are like, you know, 50 feet, you know, wide and, you know, 30 feet high. And it's very, very intricate. And, you know, I just feel like when I listen to you and I think about the ritual, like I love carnival, like in Trinidad, we call it um, playing mass. So this is something that came out of such adversity, but has become something so phenomenally beautiful where there's themes that came out of, of, you know, such adversity. And then of course, what the slaves did as well was they cut their steel drums, which carried oil. And that's what the steel pan became, the only kind of acoustic uh, instrument in the 20th century. So when I think about it, and you know, I hadn't thought about this as much uh, other than I met you and we start to talk a little bit, how valuable sometimes rituals are. Now it beca- it's basically, they call it a street fet, but really if you look at the inception of out of something so adverse, right, came something so phenomenal, and, and it's a ritual then that it's basically that you can take your power back and, uh, you know, have freedom on, on that particular two days in Trinidad. And so I wanted to just share that with you because it's, you know, and, I, and deconstructing that would probably be such an amazing thing. Uh, so I'm probably going to look at your eight questions and think about that because I think that would be really, really so help me understand it from that cultural context. So I just felt like I needed to share that with you. And it's amazing that some rituals can come out of such pain as well, but mm-hmm. that it can help us heal from so, so many, um, probably sometimes unspeakable things through history as well. Mm, yeah. Thank you for bringing, bringing that up and bringing that in. We, we, we often turn to ritual because of their power in moments of deep crisis and trauma. Um, you know, one of the, the examples I'd love to, to point at is, um, you know, is taking moments of silence after national tragedies and the way that that has become both um, uh, and, and can be such a powerful ritual in some contexts and, and, and often so rote and feels like so disconnected from what that real intention is. And, you know, one of the ritual lines is story you know, what is the, what is the framing for this ritual? What is the history that it comes from? Um, what is it, what is it connected to? And, and I, I love learning that about Carnival because now, you know, if I'm ever in a Carnival space, knowing that history, right, knowing that story, that mm-hmm. ritual has just deepened in meaning for me. I might still enjoy it if I didn't know that. I might still have a good time and the costumes are awesome. And that was such a special day and I could feel that. But knowing that, having that line added, that line of story added just deepened its meaning to me. And and what it sounds like as well is that it's, this ritual has also become a tradition and, and traditions are these actions that gain meaning through repetition. So the first time you do something, it's still a ritual. Right. It doesn't need to be repeated in order to be a ritual. The first time, you know, um, my, my colleague Casper says, you know, every, every tradition started as an innovation. So the first time carnival ever happened, it was still a ritual. Um, but through its repetition over time, year after year, and all the people who have connected to it and participated in it, and then your repetition of that ritual, seeing it again and again, and your connection to its story and the culture in the past, all that has deepened its meaning over time. So I, I love that example. Well, and I, you know, I think about it as, as we wrap up, that if we really think of um, the context of a, of a culture and, and the storying part of it, right? Like, like based on the environments, why was this company started? What, what, were, the, what were the co-founders or founders vision and how are they reusing the narrative? Um, to be able to to move this along, right? Because again, bigger companies get that those things don't get passed on. It's kind of like if you're, if you're in a startup or a smaller to mid-sized company, there's more opportunity to hear that. 
But as companies get bigger, they become a little bit more disconnected, maybe global, but ultimately, you know, not forgetting the beginnings, I think is very, very important. And it sounds like that's something with rituals that, like you said, at first it's innovation because it's new. And then it be, through repetition, it becomes ritual and then it becomes tradition with time, right? So if companies look at that as a lens, as really, ultimately, if people know um, the value of the company and why it exists in the context that it does, then, you know, ultimately you're demonstrating um, things which connection brings, like I always say, you know, I say ROR versus ROI, which is people get connected. And guess what? We all want to be the best versions of ourselves in the context of what we do day to day. Yeah, I love that. You know, I was just at the Gusto headquarters uh, in San Francisco and I saw that they, um, you know, they have a, a shoeless office. Um, and when you walk into the entrance of these like large cubby um, holes with um, people's shoes and slippers, you know, put there and a whole sort of box of socks, uh, if you're a guest and you don't have slippers. Um, and the story is that the co-founders started in their living room, uh, which was, you know, a, a, a shoeless place. It was their home. So they started the company without shoes on. And um, there was something about that that really spoke to their values of, of, of what Gusto stands for. And it's symbolic, right? It's bigger than what it is, but they, as they grew, they wanted to be a, a shoeless office. And so um, each employee, when they get hired, they get like a, a slippers budget, you know, to buy your own slippers for the office. And um, what I also learned is that over time now, to your point, as it grows and with multiple offices and multiple places, um, that's becoming less and less of a tradition at the offices and more and more people are wearing shoes and it's becoming more and more optional. And it's sort of this ancient kind of story that exists a little bit in the past, but it's cute. And some, we talk about it and, and it's at the entrance. So you see it, but um, it's not lived in and lived with as much as it used to be. And, and that is part of the challenge. How do you continue as you grow? Um, you know, if anything, the, the need becomes even even bigger because with more and more people trying to bring more and more people into singular vision um, and connected to singular values, um, you need more powerful rituals and more significant rituals to do so. And I know that it's possible because look at any country in the world, look at any religion in the world with billions of followers. So it is very possible. It's not, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but um, you know, look at the I voted stickers. Um, here in the States, the election is coming up. Um, there's all these studies that show the increase in voter participation that just getting a two cent, you know, sticker at the, at the voting booth is helping, uh, create. So, you know, what is that? It doesn't help me vote at all. It's functionally useless, but it does help me show my civic value and connect to other people. When I see the stickers around, I'm like, oh yeah, look. And there's probably some social pressure as well that comes along to it, but oh, I get to post on it. I make this. Yeah, for sure. Right. Yeah. I, I take this, I take this private action and I create a more public shared experience with it because I get to post it on social media. So it is possible to do large scale ritual. Um, and I truly believe that it will help us change the world in the directions that we want. Well, Esther, this has been amazing. I just have to thank you so much for uh, sharing, uh, you know, this wisdom. I'm sure people are, have learned a lot today, and I know I have. So for people wanting to get a hold of you, um, to have a chat or to have you speak or, or, or any of the other things that you do, where, where can people get a hold of you? Well, thanks so much. Thank you for hosting this conversation. Um, and for everyone listening, thank you for listening. I appreciate you. I don't know you. I haven't met you, but I do appreciate you. Um, if you'd like to reach out, my website is ritualist.life. That's a ritual, I-S-T, ritualist.life. And my email is Ezra at ritualist.life. That life and my social media is, is uh, Instagram is ritual underscore IST. You'll find me as Rebookman, B O O K M A N, on a lot of other handles. So um, 
find me, DM me, reach out. I love just geeking out on rituals. Uh, and I also love helping people. So um, I'd love to hear from you. And if you've got any questions or if you've got some great ritual examples from your own company or from your own work life that you'd like to share, I'm writing a book right now, and I'd love to include them. So uh, I uh, would love to hear from you. Awesome. Awesome. You're writing a book. That's amazing. Um, so what am I taking away? I think, you know, I like the line in uh, intention and attention. I love that. So for le as leaders, we really have to set the intention out there and we need to take the time um, to be introspective about what we're putting out there and how are we living the right values that allows people to understand what we're about and what we're trying to put forward. So that's what I'm taking away today, Ezra. So for everyone, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, if you're wanting to know more about um, your authenticity in your relationships, you can go to my website, roxanderhodge.com forward slash quiz. You do a, a really mini quiz. We send you back some um, the status of where you are and with some next steps. Again, Ezra, thanks so much. And everyone, we'll chat again with you next week. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.